I have been back on air for about 10 weeks now, working breakfast radio. Probably get up 10 to 5. If I've got anything special for the kids' lunches, I'll leave it out. Text my producers to let them know that I'm on my way. Pat the dog, get in the car, look at the sky and think, we're off. It's been just over 30 years since the character of Elle McFeast exploded onto uh, our TV screens. Libby as Elle McFeast was quite ahead of her time. Tonight, we are exploring the last male bastion. Yes, the football dressing room. Well, I thought, finally, a woman is doing her thing in a man's world. You can see we've got some fellas sharing behind there. Yes, I um, certainly can. And, um... She was beautifully dangerous. Her shows were very cutting edge. <laughs> Feast on Jock the Dancer coming up on the outside, down Buckle Street, Mooney Ponds, until she comes across. That feels nice. <laughs> Elle McFeast was a polarising figure. She dares to go to areas where people, other people wouldn't go. But you've written some great books, like this one. This is a beauty, How to Shoot Friends and Influence People. Uh, <laughs> but live TV, it is a tightrope. Chop. The risk is always there. Oh, sorry. Chop. And it's only when you fall off the tightrope that you realise how dangerous it can be. Once you're damaged, you can't come back from that. After that episode, television didn't want me. It, it felt like I was cancelled before cancelling was invented. You do a little yeah. kidney punch. But I still believe in risk. Yeah, that's not If you don't take risks, nothing changes. Right, everyone ready? How lucky am I at 58 to have a chance to start again? And 10 seconds, Libby. To have that freedom to experiment again. This is Enterprise Breakfast. My name is Libby Gore. Libby, she's always been a juggler. It's your oh, are we bringing her in and then doing After her breakfast radio show, she also goes twice a week to teach young film and television students. Something like, Commonwealth Games <laughs> or something sort of... It's a television show that the journalism students do. It's news satire, like McAuliffe. To unpack the housing statement, we turn now to our favourite capitalist couple. Nothing delights me more than encouraging timid, shy young people. Yay! <laughs> I love corrupting Generation Z because they need to be corrupted. I encourage them to be bold and brave and follow their passions and not to be scared and put themselves out there. That camera is looking at you and you're looking at that camera. If you don't follow your passions, you'll never find out how you can stand up and make a difference. I grew up in Melbourne in a suburb called Murrumbina. As the youngest of three, I was allowed to juggle knives. If she was told, jump off this ladder, she would jump. It cost her a broken arm, but that's the sort of girl she was. And when Libby was a little girl, we started going to the football, we still do. So I used to take Libby to the football and I took her brother David to cooking classes. That was slightly different. Working women was in my family before working women was a thing. My mother and my grandmother were pharmacists. Mum was an actively feminist mum. She wasn't talking about it and marching. I think if she'd heard the word feminist, it might have offended her, but she was. My father was a motor mechanic with his own business and after school, I'd get picked up from my private girls' school. 
dad would often come on a motorbike and we had a strict headmistress and she was scary. One day, she said to Eric, Mr Gore, it isn't really appropriate to send Libby home putting her leg over the, a motorbike. In a social sense, that wasn't my world. The fact that I was one of the few Jewish girls always made me very conscious that I was different. And it did make me think, I need to be good at things, whether it be sport or whether it be drama, like I threw myself into activities because I needed to somehow fit in. Libby moved to my school in high school. She was in the school plays. There might be 20 girls on the stage, but the only girl you'd really be looking at would be Libby. She really loved performing in front of people. I pushed Libby into doing law when she finished school. She was more interested in, in journalism. I was really down. Oh, she was really down. But somewhere along the line, someone said, do you want to audition for this comedy cabaret group called The Hot Bagels? You went jogging. Of course I said yes. I got a million stretch marks. They chronicle my life. But there's no superannuation for a mother and a wife. And that put me through the traditional comedy cabaret path that was just taking off in Melbourne, 1986, 1987. OK, recruits, grab your beanies, balls... And in the mid-80s, I was hosting a show called Kick to Kick, which was a bit of a send-up footy show. Libby came along to do a few things in the radio station. She'd created this larger-than-life persona of this person who was a bit of a football groupie but was in control. So, hi, I'm Tony Lockett, and Elle McFeast is the most beautiful creature in the world. Hi, I'm Tony Lockett, and Elle McFeast is the most beautiful creature in the world. The name Elle McFeast came out of Elle McPherson. She was on the front cover of Sports Illustrated every year, looking amazing. And there was a whole raft of us women who could never, ever be like that. So I made up Elle McFeast as a kind of pushback on that idea. That's the woman we all are, you know? The hamburger version of the supermodel. The ABC at that time was very keen on uh, having fresh new ideas going to air. Our department head said, uh, have you thought about doing something with sport? Sport was still pretty straight, and no one had been mucking around with it. He said, look, there's a female comic, and she's doing a Norman Gunston. She's got an alias. And then my agent said, can you put a tape together and send it up to Sydney? Gary, they tell me that you have the best hands in the business. Within about three minutes, I went, no, nah, no, nah, there's something good happening here. And I started with the ABC on Live and Sweaty as their Melbourne reporter. What did my father say? <laughs> what? <laughs> Andrew Denton was our host, and Libby was a very strong part of the show. Right now, we'd like to throw to our Melbourne correspondent. Her name is Elle McFeast, and she's talking to that man of many talent, Warwick Kappa. The Warwick Kappa interview was the first interview that went to air for me as Elle McFeast on Live and Sweaty. Warwick Kappa, the prodigal son of the Sydney Swans and an essential tool in the He was very much the glamour guy of the AFL at the time. Best known for his incredibly tight red shorts. And so my job was to somehow discover the man in, inside this set of shorts. The question still lingers, exactly how firm are his buttocks? Elle was in command. And until then, it had always been the opposite way around. There's no panty line. Nice. What are you doing down there? 
Elle McFeast is Libby with basically no barriers, prepared to almost say and do anything. Tell Andrew what the jeans will be like. Yeah. Oh, Ross. McFeast was a departure from female characters on TV and comedy who were, until that point, traditionally sidekicks that were very palatable. The barrel girl, the girlfriend, the girl next door. Oh. Football's night of nights, the brown low But she was really audacious. This was a young woman who wasn't waiting for permission. Who actually gets invited to the Brownlow medal? The cream of the crop. Well, at that stage, the only place for a woman in football was as a mother or a girlfriend that you took to the Brownlow. I searched high and low. Most of the dates and wives were blonde, slim, homogenous. So that's why I wrote my song. So I'm the only brunette at the Brownlow. There is no shortlist of people that I met and was lucky enough to do interviews with. It wasn't just about sport. Oh, who am I meeting today? Oh, yeah, Bob Geldof. Oh. Why is my skirt caught? Yes, turn around. It's been like that the whole time. <laughs> I, I thought you had a radio mic up there. I did. <laughs> Ow! Stop it! Don't have to make rude remarks about the size of my derriere. There is a paradox in the way McFeast would play to a male interview subject. Take a look at those oh, knobs, oh, Teddy. Oh. <laughs> Flashing your cleavage. Was she playing with form about this is how women are perceived, I'm going to play on that? Or was it outrageous? Or was it offensive? I think she's testing those boundaries, maybe not always successfully. It was Spice Girls feminism for me. It was the 90s. I walked into an environment which was agitating for equal rights in the ABC. And not only do I, you know, expect to have a voice, but a leading voice. So what was I like to work with? Probably very difficult. But, you know, it was my face on it. There we go! If wanting to be an equal part of the conversation, have your ideas heard, be considered in the production process, makes you difficult, guilty, you know. Your eyeliner smudge, sweetie. Oh. <laughs> okay. Don't speak, don't spoil it. Not everybody liked the Elle McFeast character. Some women saw me as a champion and others thought that I'd set the cause of feminism back 100 years. There was one letter that I kept just to keep myself grounded that reminded me that I had large lumpen thighs that I lumbered and that I wasn't funny and not a patch on Denton. Of course they fed into my insecurities. So I kept this because, you know, not everybody likes you. Dear Miss McFeast, I'm writing to tell you how much I hate you and your show. Now we have to watch a fat, ugly wog trying to be funny and whose only knowledge of sport is Australian rules football. Get off my TV, you fat bitch. Yours something fed in Kamozzi. I'll keep that. Doesn't spark joy, but I'll keep that. I don't know whether those letters made me feel more determined to keep on going, but they certainly made me determined to get a personal trainer. 24, a stun shot, you'll never get it. <laughs> I met Libby in her final series of Live and Sweaty. <laughs> the whole episode was, was snow-based and snow-themed. By this time, she was the regular host. But Bill, I need you. I'm sorry, Gareth. So does Asia. And she had so much power, she could call Gareth Evans to act as Q in a James Bond sketch on the ski fields. He was the foreign minister, no less. McFeast has left. Start the chase sequence. Roger. The problem was that I couldn't ski. 
So they chose a crew that could ski around me. I was selected because the ABC had a ski team that could ski backwards with uh, out stocks and with equipment. And he was the um, handsomest man on the site. <laughs> and for some reason, I skied right into him. I thought, mm, was that an accident or was it deliberate? It wasn't until a couple of years later that we started going out because I still had a life going, she had a life going. Down the track, I was offered to front and write and co-produce these social satire specials. Welcome tonight to our McFeast special, Breasts. There have been plenty of documentaries about breast cancer. So our idea, make it entertaining, make it fun. <sighs> and actually invite interest in a health issue that was affecting one in 13 of us. I have a girlfriend. She doesn't want to check the lumps in her breasts. There was the breast examination, taking my friend in the suitcase. I'm a little bit frightened. Are you? Yes. She may I would be it. too after being dragged in the suit. And it was all very spontaneous. He had no idea what was going on. How often do you specifically examine your breasts? Mm, about once a week. Why? <laughs> Feels good. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, you do not have a lump in your breast. And the relief, I can't tell you, that feeling of relief. No, 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 I'm happy well, I haven't look, got anything wrong with me, but I should have come along sooner. Yes. What that show did was it encouraged a mass of women to go and have lumps checked out that they were too frightened to do anything about. <laughs> and there was the pussy dance at the end. The breast show was extremely successful. From that point, the L McFeast brand could almost do no wrong. There were many offers, commercial television, international offers. But the great cherry on the cake was being offered a Tonight Show. As we were talking about the new program, we realised we needed to have a show that people would talk about uh, because it was so good and was so unexpected. The first guest on that show was a big secret. We discussed it as a production team. We tossed, we turned, we kind of went, oh, you know, make a splash, all right. Is here tonight live, self-confessed killer and best-selling author, Mark Brandon Chopper-Reed. Make him welcome. Chopper-Reed spanned decades in jail. He was found guilty of armed robbery, um, serious assault, torturing fellow criminals. Yeah. He was on the show because he'd just released a new book. Hmm. I think this is possibly the first time in my life where I can say I'm actually quite glad to know that that probably is a gun in your pocket. <laughs> I remember Chopper coming on and not looking right, and it turns out he was drunk. Shut up! <laughs> Yeah, you bring me on here, the piss is apparent. <laughs> you ask me questions. And so I did my best, as any woman would do at any dinner party with some drunk leering all over her and peeling him off and still being funny and polite and getting through the situation. Oh, sorry. Chop. <laughs> I don't know if Chopper was a great idea as a first guest, but it obviously was a group idea. Ziggy was a wise guy, a drug land fixer but he got laid to rest with a pink cement mixer. <laughs> Calls to my mind again that stuff can happen live on TV. That's the danger element of it. Yeah. The first one was a joke. Yeah. Dave got the wrong address and clipped yeah. the wrong bloke. <laughs> yes? That was a funny story. <laughs> uh, it was very sad. Yeah. <laughs> 
The reaction to the show afterwards, say, in the green room, was 100% positive. Um, I actually had my doubts. I did go home that night. The light was blinking, you know, on the answering machine. My, my uncle saying, oh, Libby, amazing. All of Australia will be talking about you in the morning. And I thought, oh, I must have done a good job. Mm. And then, you know, life hit. This is what happens when you mix a crass, noisy entertainer with a self-proclaimed maggot. It was hideous. I washed it with three pillows over my head. It was horrible. She wanted to entertain us with Chopper's gruesome soul. It was experimental, but I certainly understand that some people would have taken to offence. You don't want to hear about the process of him murdering somebody. It's fundamentally a matter of community standards, and I think um, the community will, will simply not wear that sort of behaviour. It wasn't just about the size of my thighs anymore, it was about my moral character. I really want to say how truly sorry I am to the people who we hurt last week, or who we offended, or who we distressed. Libby was the face of the program, and so Libby obviously copped it much more than anyone else. It was something that you had to go through, a, a very particular kind of humiliation and pain that you had to go through yourself. Look, I'd like to congratulate you. I understand you apologised at the beginning of the show for any concern caused last week. And, and it went on and, and on and on. But I do think the decision to open McFace Life with Chopper Reed was... Um, it, was a, it was a valid decision. It was just uh, badly executed and its impact was completely unforeseen, unanticipated and unbelievable. We struggled on to complete our season. As it turned out, all the doors are shut and that was the end of their character. Television didn't want me. I think at one stage I was at Triple J talking about possible jobs for the next year and, and a guy said to me, oh, God, wouldn't touch you. You're cancer. You know, I was 33. Get fucked. I know that she was doing it hard. It took Libby quite some time to overcome the backlash because it came from all directions. To reinvent yourself after an experience like that, it would have been very, very heavy. I think she probably would have had to learn to forgive Elle a little bit. Well, the thing about Elle McFeast was that everybody called me Elle. Work was so much a part of my life that I, I sort of was Elle. And so, with the unravelling of that, there was a great opportunity to explore, actually, what was it? Who, who am... What do I stand for? What do I want to do? Who am I? She threw herself into her work, her family, having children, raising kids. I just kept going. I did a live show. I started writing a film, still writing a film. I did talk to lots of people and I did seek counselling. And then ABC Local Radio gave me an opportunity. The deal was that I had to do overnights, swallow my pride and do it as myself, as Libby Gore, and learn how to be myself. And it culminated in being invited down to Melbourne to backfill for the drive host over the summer of 2009, when, of course, the Black Saturday bushfires struck. Dozens of fires are burning out of control across Victoria. The worst fears of emergency services... I was the local radio manager. I decided that I wanted all our presenters to be out at various flashpoints across the state. My instinct was to keep Libby in the studio in Melbourne. I remember overhearing a conversation saying, we'll just move Libby to overnights or something and we'll find someone credible to go down to Whittlesea. And I walked into his office and I said, why don't you send me to Whittlesea? And my response was 
to not send her because I thought, actually, you're the funny person, you know, and it's not a time for jokes. And I said to him, I'm actually more than jokes. And then he just walked out onto the floor and he said, Libby's going to Whittlesea. And everyone else went, Wah. At the refuge in Whittlesea, shell shock is giving way to raw emotion. No one was prepared for the extent of this devastation. We put an outside broadcast point on the cricket ground and people approached her. They recognised her from her time on TV. Roscoe, your children. <laughs> Mate, you know, they were just the best. You know? Ross Buchanan spoke to me about losing his kids in the fires that day. I lost two children, Neve and Mackenzie, nine and 15. My mother-in-law's in intensive care with burns to her body from trying to go back into the house. Lots of people tried to help so much, um, risking their lives. The cruelty of that, of nature. Uh, now that's, that, that's devastation, not bloody television. It's perspective, it matters. McFace life doesn't matter. Advocating for people, telling people stories matters. Good morning. It's five minutes past 10 o'clock. Today is Sunday, the 19th of December. After that, it's like we didn't pigeonhole her. And she went on to do really different work at the ABC after I'd left. She continued on local radio. I think she was doing it for nearly a decade. How can you create a winning mindset for 2022? It became clear to me, though, that there would be no further progression for me, that I had to leave. And thank you, Melbourne and Victoria, for taking me into your hearts in this chapter of my life. Not long after, I got a phone call and it was Steve Kite. And I said, look, I've been asked to help build this new channel. It's called Disrupt Radio, something very different from the current radio offering. A new digital radio station with a focus on business. Would you consider being part of it? And I said, that sounds exciting. This is Lord Tweek of Disrupt Radio and uh, Bob Geldof just sort of miraculously appeared to launch the week with me. Has anyone got a pen? Is it going to hurt me today? I walked in and that glitter rainbow and that denim jacket just did it for me. And you know what? When you... Bring me sunshine. Oh, my God. Do to do. Bob with his attitudes and he's funny. I know he means it in jest and humour, but it's so 30 years ago, it reminds me of why I invented Ellen in the first place. Turn it off, Bob. <laughs> I need to get off the chatbot. Bring me sunshine. Oh, God, he's going to start tap dancing. <laughs> the spirit of Elle McFeast, I think it's still there. I think it's like a burning ember and it comes out when it has to. Even today, people will stop Libby in the street and say, hey, you're Elle McFeast. We share a face, Elle McFeast and I. So I am delighted at whatever impact Elle had on people's lives. Because I know it was overwhelmingly a positive impact on mine. It's the birthday girl. There are no definites in life. I've come now to understand that no one gets through life unscathed. However, there's always an opportunity for redemption. I said to Mum, why don't we have a 19th birthday party where I invite all my friends? <laughs> <laughs> because let's face it, I know you've talked about me to them a lot. <laughs> the recalibration of me from McFeast then to who I am now has all got to do with good family good friends and that desire to get back up. Ooh. 
She's so fine, you know, I wish she was mine. Now, come on. Harry, a little bit of an instrumental break now. That's fine. <laughs> That's all. Perfect. <laughs>